<clears throat> All right, it's on you, by the way, just so you know. Sure. All right, we're going to call him. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Look at that, look at that. Oh, that might be too much. <laughs> you said. I know. Why is it not going? Hello? Are we on Periscope? Yeah, oh, we're yeah. on Periscope. There it is, okay, there we go. He just retweeted us oh. too. Look at that. Yeah. Very nice of him. I would... Hello. Hey, is this uh, Sean? It sure is, what's hey, going on, guys? Hey man, it's Justin, Tim, and Kevin from the Driving Dish Podcast. How you doing? Good, good. Uh, Tim made me very creamy coffee. That's so much cream. Are you speaking English? I'm sorry, I was laughing. He made me really creamy coffee. That's kind of nasty. Um, so, uh, just just a little heads up. We pre-record all the um, episodes. So, okay. if there's anything you say and you want us to take it out or you stumble over something you want us to take it out, uh, just let us know and then do a 3, 2, 1 count in and we can, we can take it out for you, okay? Sure thing. Sure. Awesome. All right, so introing you for the show, we're obviously going to mention about today's fast break and thunderousintentions.com. Is there anything else in particular you would like us to hit in your intro? Uh, we have the Thunderous Intentions uh, blog has semi-started a, uh, a podcast. If you wouldn't mind just going off the Thunderous Perfect. Transmissions, you yeah. can find it on the website and SoundCloud for now. We are working to get that on iTunes, but it's not there yet. All right, and, and so excuse me for saying that again. It's the it's just the Thunderous oh, Intention yeah. podcast, or it has it's a different name, too? Find it on the Thunderous Intentions podcast. All right. Yeah, how do I? I'll, I'll, I'll read this down real quick. Hey, Sean. So, um, I'm I'm glad you told us about that because I'm going to ask you a little bit about podcasting at the end. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about your uh, relationship with the team and and specifically how you cover them? I'm, some of my questions are um, oh. might change depending a, upon um, the level of credential you have with the team. Yeah, um, essentially, I'm about um, two hours north of Oklahoma City. I'm in Wichita, and oh, wow. um, I, you know, as far as uh, my relationship with the team, I am 100% um, trying to be a uh, non-biased fan. But uh, you know, I'm, I just write for Thunderous Intentions as sort of one of their staff writers. Okay. Um, but I don't cover the team in any, um, you know, any close capacity. So uh, you weren't you weren't specifically like speaking to the players in in the locker room on on a regular basis. That's correct. Okay, perfect. So that's that's good to know. Okay, um, good, 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 good. All right, okay. Let's get started. You guys ready? Yeah. Um, and then Tim, obviously, we're gonna have to use this mic because I don't think he can I hear know, on I that mic. Forget, I don't. Tim, is re <laughs> Tim is really excited about his first question. Oh yeah, there's a, there's a huge debate between me and Tim on this one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. So if you guys are ready, uh, we're good. Yeah. I'm all right. right. We are <laughs> recording. All right. Three, two, one. So we are joined on the line now by Sean Woods. He's at Sean underscore Woods 15 on Twitter. He's dot com and thunderousintentions.com, as well as a host for their new podcast from thunderousintentions.com. The name of the podcast is Thunderous Transmissions. Thons, or, whoa, three, two, one. Sean, thanks for joining us on the program, man. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good, good. You know, it's sunny. It's unseasonably warm in Jacksonville, Florida today. I know, I know our, our Northeast and some of our Midwest listeners aren't going to be liking it, but it's, it's supposed to be 80 here this weekend, man. I'm trying to get ready for Christmas, and it's going to be 80 degrees. It's, uh, you know, living in the Midwest, it's, it's traditionally usually pretty cold right now, but uh, we're, we're experiencing some unseasonably good weather as well, although I think that's that's we speak. But mm. it's been nice this week, if nothing else. So, Sean, I guess I want to start this out with a, a burning question that's, <laughs> it just, it blows my mind. And as Justin mentioned earlier, we have differing opinions on this. Can you tell me why the hell Roberson is starting? Yeah, I guess that's it. Why the hell is Roberson starting, man? I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> well, it's it's probably good that I'm here then, because I, um... I think I am the number one uh, Andre Alperson defender. Yeah. See? Thank um, you! <laughs> and, okay, so uh, I will freely admit that uh, Andre Alperson has his downfalls. He is a horrific three-point shooter. He's, um, you know, he put the ball in his hands, and the, the term record scratch is going around, and I think it was invented for Andre Alperson. When he gets the ball, the whole offense sort of stops and doesn't do anything. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
However, specifically in the starting lineup with Russell Westbrook, who isn't the uh, the staunchest defender, and Kevin Durant, who you don't want to put a big load on, especially these now, what, 17, 18 games back from his injury, Andre Robertson is a terrific defender. Not only is he a terrific on-ball defender, but as a team defender, Andre Robertson does a lot of things well. Um, I don't believe shooting guard is probably his best position. Um, I would like to see him used uh, sort of as a small ball power forward. He played power forward at Colorado. He's got the length. He's about he's six seven. I think his his wingspan's about six eleven, which is incredibly long for a shooting guard. But unfortunately, with this specific Thunder roster, when you've got Ibaka and Durant and Adams and all these guys who need minutes at the four and five, and you're obviously not going to insert Andre Robertson there. But with this specific starting lineup, he does serve a a purpose in. Uh, in that he's going to make up for all the things that Russell Westbrook can't do on defense and that you don't want to bestow on Kevin Durant. Well, yeah, you just spoke about how he played power forward in college, which kind of explains why he can't shoot worth a lick. Um, it seems like the shooting guard position is is a little bit thin, and I also get the argument of you already have two guys on the court who really need the ball in their hand all the time, so you don't want to put somebody else on the court. Like Deion Waiters wouldn't be a good fit in the in the starting lineup. But it seems to me, just from an eye test perspective, that when I'm watching the Thunder offense with with him on the floor, that players aren't even remotely guarding him. So then it becomes a a, a four on five as far as offensive, uh, as far as their offense is concerned. And is that more detrimental to the offense than having him on defense is helpful? Um. As far as their sort of net differential, which is a pretty good indicator of how they've played, um, it is. I think it's about six points um, in the positive when Andre Robertson is on the floor. Although I'll freely admit their offense is uh, either league average or just below league average. It's not good when Andre Robertson is on the floor, but their defense is at an elite level. I think the Spurs lead the league with like an 89 uh, defensive rating. Mm-hmm or somewhere around there, and the Thunders with Andre Robertson on the floor as of a couple of days ago was about 92. So it is really good. Now it becomes more of a problem in the playoffs when you saw last year in the playoffs when the Grizzlies played the Warriors. The Warriors didn't guard Tony Allen. That same thing's probably going to happen uh, when Andre Robertson, if Andre, Andre Robertson and the Thunder play the Warriors or whoever it is um, in the Western playoffs, but for now, it, it sure seems like there's a uh, there's a positive correlation to Andre Robertson and winning for the Thunder. Right. Well, and you just brought it up with their defense. Uh, I guess a lot of our our Reddit fans wanted to us to ask the question: Can the Thunder play consistently good defense? And they were pointing out a lot that they were having trouble in the in the like last five minutes of games where they would just kind of lose their shot and look lackluster on defense, and then, you know, Westbrook would go on one of those rampage and every once in a while bail them out. But they're wondering, is there any way the, is there any way that the Thunder can consistently be playing better defense, or what would, what would you do to try to address that, I guess? You know, that's, that's a little tough, because the Thunder, um, the Thunder, they weren't very good on defense when Kevin Durant was out, and I think that, I mean, that can be explained just because Kevin Durant is a, and I'm using air quotes, is a 6'9 um, <laughs> player with a 7'2 wingspan or something. And when you take a player with that length out, he doesn't have to defend very well as long as he gets his long arms up. And you, you insert Anthony Morrow or Dion Waiters, I mean, you're losing five, six inches in both cases, as well as foot speed and just general knowledge on defense. Um, so, I, you know, the Thunder's defense is back up to just above league average. Um, I think they're giving up about 103 points per 100 possessions, which is it's not great, and it's it's definitely um, it's definitely down from the Scott Brooks Thunder, but it's it's climbing if nothing else. And and although the last three four minutes are often tough to watch as a Thunder fan on offense, the the offense is you know behind the the Warriors, they're probably the best offense in the league right now. So it's it's been it's been a little frustrating to watch, but I, um, one of the well, the editor actually at uh, Thunderous Intentions always says that with with Thunder games, it always seems like a loss is the end of the world, and and a win means a championship, and uh, it certainly feels like that. Just following along on Twitter and and everything, but you know, it's I think uh, has something to do with 
Oklahoma being the Thunder being the only professional team in Oklahoma, and and I, I think it's just maybe an overreaction on both sides. Yeah, I think that's one thing a lot of people take for granted coming from bigger markets is is the ability to have four teams. I know you know you see Portland is kind of the same way where you know you essentially got to go on all in, on in one team so you can you can understand where the where the ebb and flow of their emotions is coming from. But talking about the Thunder's offense, we you know, we just have to talk about it. Russell Westbrook is playing absolutely out of his mind this year. His effective field goal percentage is 51% right now. He's got career highs in assists. He's averaging almost 10 a game. 26 points a game. His field goal percentage, his actual field goal percentage, is also a career high right now. And it, it just seems like, you know, people have always given Westbrook un, or I'm looking for the word here, but just unreasonable crap for lack of a better term here for just his shot selection and for not distributing the ball despite the fact that he's averaging 10 assists a game. I guess what have you seen out of Westbrook this year that's allowed him to elevate his game to a whole other level? Because it seems like he's seriously challenging Kevin Durant as the best player in this lineup. You know, a lot of this, I think, started last year when Kevin Durant missed all of it, whatever it was, 23 games. Um, Russell Westbrook did almost this exact same thing. Now, the, the difference between last year and this year is he was turning the ball over at an extremely high rate last year. And I think just adding a player of Kevin Durant's caliber, um, you know, defenses now can't double. They can't help defender that's not on Andre Robertson just to Russell Westbrook because now they also have to take into account the former MVP, Kevin Durant. It's Russell Westbrook's vision has always been outstanding. Um, I think uh, Nylon Calculus did a great article on how he's arguably one of the best passers in the NBA when you consider everything else. Uh, his, you know, free uh, assists that lead to free throws, essentially, and blown assists where they miss the attempted shot. He's he's had an outstanding season, and, and you mentioned he's, I think, second behind Rondo in assists per game and averaging something like five minutes fewer per game. It's, he's really having an outstanding season, and his best attribute um, as far as a 6-3 point guard is concerned is probably his rebounding. And he's, you know, he's, he's finishing or he's averaging seven rebounds per game, which is unheard of for a guard. He's uh, second on the team behind Kevin Durant, uh, ahead of, so, oh, sorry, third on the team behind Kevin Durant and Ennis Cantor. Um, but it's, you know, I'd like to see him cut down on the turnovers, but if you'd like a 90% of what a player does, it's really hard to bicker about the, the 10% that you don't like. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that everybody's, and it, it's always really bothered me. I think a, a couple of episodes ago that we were talking about on the show where I was watching the Thunder, and I can't remember who they were playing. They might have been playing the Bulls at the time, but uh, Charles Barkley and it, really the other commentators, they just, throughout the entire game, they just kept talking about what Russell Westbrook isn't. And it seems like finally this year, apart from those commentators, that, that people are, are really starting to appreciate what he is. And uh, are you getting that feeling from, from the fans around that they're finally, like, they've, they've stopped that, well, he should be doing this, he should be doing this, and they're just appreciating how good he really is? It definitely, definitely feels, at least locally, that people are, are starting to understand that, although I don't necessarily agree that he's... Um, the best player or better than Kevin Durant, he's arguably the most important player on the team because as Russell Westbrook goes, so do the Thunder. Now, you saw in the six games that Durant missed, the offense struggled and the defense heavily struggled, but that's going to happen when you commit so much of your resources into one player and he misses six games. But um, it, it, it definitely does feel like people are starting to understand, um, you know, there are very few players that can average 26 points, 10 assists, and over seven rebounds per game, and one of them currently plays for the Thunder. Well, my qu my question to you is because I know it was always you know Westbrook and Durant were the the one and two scoring options for this team, and it always seemed kind of like um, Serge Ibaka was number three. But what I was noticing the other day is. Um, the Thunder have three players in the top 20 for uh, player efficient, efficiency rating, which is Westbrook, Durant, and actually Cantor, uh, which was kind of surprising to me. So my question is, are they kind of leaning towards Ennis Cantor as their third scoring option, or are they still sticking with Ibaka and it's just, it's just not showing up through that, through, that, uh, through that stat? I think some of that, and probably most of that, can be explained through lineups. They like to play Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook with, or Ibaka with one of those two. Mm -hmm. Whereas when Ennis Cantor is is running the show, 
it's almost his his show to run. He's he's very efficient on the post, but Kevin Durant's a far more efficient player on the post. So if both of those players are in the game at the same time, you'd rather Kevin Durant have the ball than Ennis Cantor. Um, and Serge Ibaka's never been um, the best scorer. He's you know he's at best uh, probably what he is on this team, a third option scoring. He's a he's a fantastic mid range shooter. If he could get more attempts from the three, which is what I would like to see. He's a, he's a fantastic uh, three-point shooter, although he has up to that to almost uh, 37% on the year, which is, which is above average. Um, but, you know, Ennis Cantor's ability is, is scoring. He's, he's a, you know, it's, a lot of it has been made about his defense. Um, it is not good, and it is still not good. But um, as far as scoring goes, he's one of the most efficient scoring bigs in the league, and uh, I think Billy Donovan has done a very good job limiting his minutes to, to he's about 20 minutes per game, and he's allowed him to sort of go all out in those 20 minutes because Ennis Cantor knows he's only going to get about 20 minutes per game. Um, he's using him in the right matchup. I believe against the Hawks the other night, he only played 10 minutes or so because the Hawks are, you know, they have that system that's going to move it uh, from side to side, swing the ball and, and put Ennis Cantor in a lot of uncomfortable situations. So he. Billy Donovan didn't put in his cancer in those situations, but when he plays against teams that he knows he can um, he can take advantage of, that's where Ennis Cantor really thrives. So I, I think um, at least one positive early in the season for Billy Donovan is, is how he's used Ennis Cantor um, specifically in those second lineups. Yeah, I was reading that Ennis Cantor is getting 33% of his points off of offensive rebounds, which in and of itself just has a ton of value. Uh, I was I was watching that Hawks game that you're referring to a minute ago. I guess um, you, you mentioned how Cantor didn't really play a lot. And so you have Cantor, who's basically a, you know, a max player that's playing 10, 20 minutes a game. And it, it sort of, to me, seems like a little bit of waste of resources, but I understood why they did it. But speaking of that Hawks game, it seems like, and I, maybe you can tell me if, that, if this was game specific or a problem with the Thunder altogether, but it seems like they had a really hard time getting out to, to players behind the three-point line, and that's where they were giving up the majority of their points, at least against the Hawks. Is that consistent with the Thunder this season, or was that just sort of an anomaly? I believe that's just game-specific. Now, I haven't looked at this in a few games, but uh, I wrote an article um, a few, a couple, probably a couple of weeks ago, and actually the Thunder gave up the fewest um, three-point attempts per game. Um, so they've actually done a really good job as far as uh, limiting shots behind the line. And I know Billy Donovan came in with the idea that he was going to not allow opponents to shoot threes. Um, and I'll give you an update. And they have actually moved down. Oh, sorry. Um, they're, they're doing okay. They're averaging, let's see, they're the third best team as far as limiting um, three-pointers, and only the Warriors and Spurs are ahead of them. And so that's at least a good indicator for good defenses, as both of those defenses are very good. Um, the Thunder have actually um, been hurt in other areas. Uh, when I wrote that article, they were, they were terrible at allowing opponents to shoot at the rim, but very good at defending the rim. So they would allow them to get there, but then not allow them to make it. But after so many attempts at the rim, you know, those are the most efficient shots. So those are going to start to fall and start to go in. So the Thunder's problem early in the year and up to this point has not been um, allowing opponents to shoot the three. It's more um, in other areas, allowing them to get to the rim and to the free throw line. So the Thunder last year went out and acquired Dion Waiters. And Dion Waiters well, is an interesting player, to say the least. There's very, you know, the, the two camps on Dion Waiters are very, very different. And, you know, you have the guy, the people who think that Dion Waiters is a black hole on offense and that he takes bad shots and that he, he just slows things. And you have other people who think that Waiters can be that spark that you need to give that extra burst of offense. And I guess here we are now in the first full year of Dion Waiters in the Thunder system. And what has he been for this team? Are, are, are the Thunder satisfied with Dion Waiters? You know, how do they see him playing into the team going forward? You know, the, the Thunder have always liked to use a guard off the bench to carry the second lineup. And along with Ennis Cantor, Deion Waiters has done that this year. I would argue that Deion Waiters hasn't done it very well. Um, but some of that can also be explained, as we talked about a little earlier, in the lineups. I, 
when you have uh, an Ennis Cancer and a DJ Augustine and a Dion Waiters and a, at the time it was Kyle Singler, there's not a lot of offensive firepower and there's not a lot of, of floor spacing to allow Dion Waiters to work. With that said, he's he's been pretty miserable thus far. He, he is averaging um, almost 11 points in 28 minutes, but he's shooting under 40% from the field. And after a hard, hot start from three, he's under 35%. Um, and, you know, if there was that one game and uh, small sample size and all that, but there was that one game where he went four for five. So if you take that out, he's probably under 33 or 32 percent. His assist, uh, he's, he's only averaging, I think he's got eight more total assists on the year than turnovers, and that's in 23 games. So, you know, Deion Waiters is a shot creator, but right now the only shot he's creating is a, a terrible shot for himself. And um, I don't love it. I'm hoping that. Um, the Dion Waiters is, will be a restricted free agent next summer, and I'm hoping someone throws some money, maybe Philadelphia, because that's where he's from, will throw some money at him. He wants a max from them, apparently. I would, and I would, I would allow it. Let him come to Philadelphia. Sean, Sean, please, not to interrupt you, don't let that happen. God, Tim's been, <laughs> Tim's been making fun of us, because Justin and I are Sixers fans, and Tim's been bringing this up for ages, and I, I just, I cannot, my heart cannot handle a Dion Waiters max contract. Well, you guys have been missing that veteran presence. There he is. Oh, <laughs> <Dion Waiters>. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm glad you brought up the bench unit. Um, you, you look at the the, the Thunder's uh, bench, the the unit that they're using to to close the the first and the third quarters, and and they've really just been a huge net negative, um, you know, for for the team over the over the course of the season so far. And it has a, uh, And you were just talking about how the Thunder really want to bring that that guard off the bench that can really carry the second unit, but it doesn't seem like they've been able to do that thus far, and so. One of the lingering questions that has been around for a couple of seasons or has been around for a couple of seasons is trying to stagger Russell and um, and, and Katie's minutes. I mean, if you look at the floor when they're on the floor together, it's it's always a pot and a, a, a net positive. Um, but that that lineup of Moro, um, uh, DJ Collison, and Cantor, they have a net negative of negative seventeen point seven points and you know just thirty eight minutes of play. But, I mean, what do, you, what do you think that the Thunder should do? Should they start to stagger those minutes a bit more than they do now? That's another thing that uh, Donovan's um, starting to progress with a little bit. At the beginning of the season, Durant and, and Westbrook would play um, all, if not, or most, if not all, of the first quarter. And here recently, uh, Westbrook will come out of the game somewhere around the uh, six to ten minute mark. And he'll try to bring him in, uh, usually about, you know, eight to ten, eight, six to eight minutes left in the second quarter. So he'll still get his normal rest, but he'll bring him back a little bit earlier and, and stagger those lineups a little bit. Um, however, you know, that lineup that we, we talked about earlier and that you just mentioned is, is pretty terrible defensively. There's not, there's not a whole lot that you can expect when you've got Ennis Cantor and, and DJ Augustine on the floor. Um, but, you know, I think that's something that, that uh, Donovan didn't do well at the beginning of the year, and I was pretty critical at the beginning of the year. Just uh, I didn't I didn't believe that he was doing anything well. Um, but there are there are a few things that he started to come around on, and that's that's definitely one of them. Well, and so actually that brings up a good question. What am I? What would you grade Donovan so far this year, like as a coach? How would you grade him? Um, you know that's it. I'm not going to say that, that uh, everything for him has been easy. You know, he was put in a really tough situation. He had to follow Scott Brooks that, um, you know, Kevin Durant and, and Russell Westbrook just loved. And it, it's tough to come in and, and sort of be the, uh, you know, the stepdad to this team. But um, Donovan really struggled at the beginning. He he was, like I said, he was playing those, the almost a hockey lineup. And it was, it was pretty bad. He, he'd sub five in and, and uh, the, net, the second units just would, would get destroyed. He was playing McGarry and Cantor at the same time. And, and you know, McGarry since has been sent down to the blue, and he's gotten very few minutes. And uh, Donovan's improved there. I, I'd probably give him, you know, a solid B minus, C plus. He's been fine, and uh, it's tough to be bad when you have Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook. But some of the things um, I don't love, it doesn't seem like he's gotten to them about – the late game situations and running some of his about just 
giving the ball to Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant, but I'd like to see a little more action uh, on getting there. And, you know, Greg Popovich is famous for not showing teams anything in the regular season and then, and then you know, unleashing it in the postseason. But you don't have that luxury when you're a first-year coach with players that might leave next year. Um, and we've yet to see much of that, even just a simple uh, Westbrook and Durant pick and roll, which was sort of prevalent at the beginning of the year, has, has gone by the wayside recently. But I'd give them a, uh, a solid C plus, B minus on the year so far. I, well, you just brought it up. You said that they were kind of cutting back on Mitch McGarry's uh, minutes there a little bit. Do you? One of our Reddit questions was, do you think McGarry would make a better uh, small ball lineup than their lineup they're running out with Abaka? No, um, I. I I um I'm a big Abaka defender because of who the Thunder employ. They with um Russell Westbrook and Ennis Cantor and Anthony Morrow and Dion Waiters, all of those guys um lack the either awareness or foot speed or whatever it is to keep their uh keep their man in front of them and Abaka is one of the best at erasing mistakes. He's a very good shot blocker, but he's also an extremely good rim protector. Um, he's shown the ability to at least be an above average um, big man as far as switching on to guards on the perimeter. And that's, you know, that's a strategy that the Thunder have, have always used. And they're using it a little bit less this year. Last year, they, they mostly switched the pick and roll. This year, they're starting to drop a little bit where they'll play a little more conservative style, which I think hurt their defense at first because although they weren't allowing very many three-pointers, they were allowing them to shoot at a very high percentage, probably because a lot of them were open. But, um, you know, Serge Ibaka is, has been labeled as the, the basketball unicorn by a lot of people because he's, he's an elite pick and pop shooting big he's like i said earlier 37 percent from three he was around 38 last year um and he's a very good um rim protector and that's just something that you know there's really not another of in a league that's getting paid 12 million dollars or whatever serge abaca's incredibly cheap contract is so switching gears a bit we've Avoided, successfully avoided it, this entire thing. <laughs> we, did get, we, did, we did get a question on Twitter that we do have to ask. And, there, and there's actually comments about Kevin Durant that I want to ask about in a second, too. But first, the question comes from Patrick Waring on Twitter, at Waring Patrick. He asks, just how big of a distraction, if any at all, has KD's upcoming free agency been? And I guess, what is the pulse of the fans right now? Um, it's definitely something that's talked about on a, on a daily basis, but... Um, I think Kevin Durant's done, you know, done a, done a pretty good job of just nipping everything in the bud and saying, you know, look, I'm going to talk about it when when it happens. There's no reason for us to stress about it for the next what are we at seven months now? Nothing can happen <laughs> officially until January 9th or 10th or July 9th or 10th. So there's really, you know, he's done a very good job of just saying, look, I'm going to be here and I'm going to play, and, and when that time comes, then then we'll talk about it then. And I don't I don't blame him at all for that. You know, this he's a 27 year old guy who's always been in Oklahoma City and and you know while the the city is great when when you're trying to thrive and be a young star I don't know if Oklahoma City is is, is the place for you um, but he you know he's accepted it when he LeBron had his big decision and Kevin Durant tweeted out I'm staying in Oklahoma City for his max contract so if he's at least shown his gratitude to Oklahoma City and the fans, and I don't blame him at all if he wants to go. Obviously, I would rather um, root for him for the entirety of his career. But, you know, if it's something that he wants to explore, um, then, uh, you know, more power to him. But up to this point, he's, he's been very good as, as far as um, not addressing it and just saying it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter right now. We're, we're seven months away. But speaking of other KD things that have been addressed in recent weeks, you know, his comments about the media certainly raised some eyebrows, and, and specifically with Kobe and how the media treated Kobe and, and how KD feels that the NBA media just really isn't treating a legend the right way. I mean, I guess what did you make of those comments? And, and as someone covering the Thunder, you know, how did you as a member of the media feel about Kevin Durant's comments? Um, they were um, probably a little unwarranted. I. You know, um, I haven't been the um, biggest Kobe fan is just for the, as far as the past few years go, but, um, you know, we're not Kobe's PR department. And if 
if that's what, you know, if that was our job, then I can understand Kevin Durant coming out and lashing out and saying we're not respecting his legacy. But, right, Kevin or Kobe Bryant has a fantastic career, and he'll go down as one of the, you know, ex-greatest players. I don't really want to get into that argument unless you do, but <laughs> wherever he's going to be, he's going to be, you know, in the top 50 greatest players. We'll say that. But we're not arguing his legacy right now. We're arguing where he is as a player right now. And I think you can say objectively, Kobe Bryant is a terrible basketball player right now. <laughs> um, and that's sort of what was brought about. And maybe, maybe it was a little, um, it, was, it was a little too much, but I think that, you know, anytime uh, a star goes out, you want to, you want to get the last word and you want, everybody wants to put their two cents in. And I think that's what's happening right now. So while I understand that Kobe Bryant was the player that Kevin Durant probably looked up to um, as a as a young kid and, and even in his first few years in the league, um, a lot of the statements that he made were, were probably misguided. They probably missed the mark or uh, misunderstood what the uh, you know the general population was trying to to get across. Kevin, do you want to do a reset and then I'll ask my question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Three, two. One, but you're listening to the Driving Dish NBA podcast. Kevin Rafuse, Tim Tompkins, Justin Kuzar, Sean Woods is on the line with us. We're talking Thunder. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at Sean underscore Woods fifteen. So, Sean, a, a minute ago you approached the the subject of Kevin Durant leaving um, this offseason, or at least the possibility of it. And it, it seemed like the the general consensus is le at least is to what I. Um, understood out there is that if the Thunder didn't make it to the finals or let me phrase that differently if the Thunder made it to the finals this year that there was a really good chance that Kevin Durant would say because you don't really leave a team that just made it to the finals apart from like LeBron it just doesn't really happen a lot given you know Steph Curry and, and the Warriors this year do you think that the Thunder making a deep playoff run would be enough for Kevin Durant to stay? Probably. Um, you know, it's tough to say. As I said earlier, I'm nowhere near uh, Oklahoma City, and I don't cover uh, – I'm not in the locker room on a day-to-day -day basis, but it sure does seem like, um, you know, Russell Westbrook and, and Kevin Durant and Serge Ibaka and Dion Waiters, and all those guys are really close. So um, it, it, it feels like if, if a deep playoff run were to happen, if, you know, even the Western Conference Finals, because at that point you can um, – it feels like the Cavs are going to come out of the East, but it almost feels like whoever's left standing in the West uh, will have a legitimate shot um, to probably lose to the Warriors. But, if, <laughs> you know, it, if they can get that far, even to the – I'd say even the Western Conference Finals, I think that Kevin Durant could look around and say, you know, we're still 27, 28 at that point probably. We're, we have one of the youngest rosters in the league as far as contending teams. And – um, a lot of the um, alternatives or other teams have, have probably been put on a pedestal a little bit because we like, you know, we like drama. We like saying that Kevin Durant's going to go home, and and when you look at home or you look at some of the other rosters, they're not quite as intriguing as Russell Westbrook, who's you know, inarguably a top 10, 15 player. Serge Ibaka, like I said earlier, is one of the best defenders in the entire league, and possibly an up and coming coach. Um, you know, they're there's a lot in Oklahoma City to look up for, and you know, with with Kevin Durant, that you have to look around and and you know, you get to the Western Conference Finals, and then look around and say, "There's Russell Russell Westbrook. Where can I just go and join a player of his ability?" So the the Warriors uh, death lineup, and you know, I'm pretty sure if you're listening right now, you know what it is. But just to remind you, it's it's Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Harrison Barnes. Um, Andre Iguodala at the at the three or the four, Harrison Barnes at the four, um, Draymond Green at the five. It seems like that is the the lineup that no team can really overcome. Now the Thunder, their small ball lineup of of Westbrook, Dion Waiters, Anthony Morrow, Kevin Durant, and Serge Ibaka has been really effective this season, even if it's been used just in, in limited minutes. Do you think that the Thunder's small ball lineup is enough to beat the Warriors? And I'm asking that because. I don't really, it, it seems at least to me that that lineup is the league's best chance at, at winning a seven game series against the Warriors. Um, okay, so there might be two different questions there. Is that the league's best chance at beating uh, the Warriors? Maybe, I, I might put the Cavs um, as number two, but I, I don't, 
I know we're, you know, the Warriors are only 24 games in, but I don't know right now if, if you can actively say that there's a there's a roster that's good enough to beat the Warriors, and, and they've shown it over and over again by just pounding teams or surviving on a on a inefficient Steph Curry night as they, you know, as was last night against the Celtics. Um, so I I think that it's probably the Thunder's lineup is probably in the top two contenders to uh, to at least give the Warriors a shot. Uh, or to give a shot against the Warriors, excuse me, but I don't know if it's enough at this point um, because you look at the the Warriors roster offensively and they don't have any holes. Um, you know, all of those players can either shoot or play make or both. And then you look at the Thunder's roster and Anthony Morrow is is a great shooter, but he can't do much else. And Deion Waiters at this point, I'm not really sure what 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 he's good or. Or even you know above average at, and then you look defensively, and that <laughs> Warriors lineup. That's where they make their money with Draymond Green uh, able to protect the rim, and Serge Ibaka is great at that. But if you know Russell Westbrook and Deion Waiters and Anthony Morrow, you know, are basically traffic cones right now out there on defense, then you can't put all that pressure on Durant and Ibaka um, to to. To pick up your defense, you know Kevin Durant's not the the greatest defender. He's he's improved a lot and he's above average at least right now. But that's only two positive defenders in a lineup that would be facing at least four, probably five in the Warriors. So um, I guess that's a long way of saying probably not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, that's fair enough. I'm re- I'm really intrigued by that that small ball lineup in particular against Warriors. But you know that's just me. Um, so Sean, tell me about your podcast. Um, okay, so we have the um, Thunderous Transmissions podcast. It's something that um, the editor of Thunderous Intentions, David Ramil, and I uh, started. Both of those in, so we're trying to get you know, some of the audio uh, on our podcast will not be up to par, I'm sure, with this one. But it's you know it's something that that we do when we can. We're both um, working and, and can't do this full time, so you know we we talk. We try to go weekly. Um, so far, we have been unsuccessful, but we've gone about two out of the three or four weeks. Uh, Sean, we appreciate you joining us on the line. And for any of our fans, make sure you go check that out. We've been talking to Sean Woods. Follow him on Twitter at SeanWoods15. Again, check out today's fastbreak.com, thunderousintentions.com, and Thunderous Transmissions. Sean, one final thing before we get you out of here. Does the ball ever lie? The ball never lies. See? There you go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, so we'd love to have you back on the show sometime, man. We've, um, you know, great interview, and, and especially if, if uh, you know, I'd love to have you on before the end of the season to kind of check back in on the Thunder, maybe as it you know gets a little bit closer to uh, to the playoffs. Cap stuff too, especially. What was the last part? Oh, I would say cap stuff too. You know, you mentioned the CBA too. Oh, you know, yeah. well, we always yeah, love talking absolutely. CBA, especially yeah, with people I, that know it better than we do. I I love to talk about that stuff, and it gets a little nerdy, so I try to avoid it a little bit um, because I know a lot of people don't care, and and I'm actually a uh, math teacher, so some of that stuff comes. <laughs> Um, not easier, but I, it interests me a little much. Well, that's we all work in radio, so that's a pretty accurate establishment of where our math skills are at. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair, but yeah, hey, anytime you guys uh, you need someone or just need uh, a few minutes to kill, just, just hit me up. I'll be available. Hey, and so you just mentioned David, um, your, your partner in crime over there. You said he covers the heat? He um, likes the heat. I don't know if he covers the heat. He, uh, he has another podcast with Wes, I think it's Goldberg. They're both they both write for Hardwood Paroxysm. The E-Check, um, 